DuPont Cavalcade of America, starring Virginia Bruce. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings you The Girl Who Ran for President, starring Virginia Bruce on the Cavalcade of America. First, here is Gain Whitman. Good evening. Here's something you should know before you buy rainwear or sportswear. There are two kinds of water repellents, the renewable type and the durable type. Renewable water repellents come out when garments are washed or cleaned and must be replaced. Durable water repellents, like DuPont ZLAN, continue to give weather protection. ZLAN protection lasts through many washings or cleaning. Keep your weather eye open for the ZLAN tag on rainwear and on sportswear. ZLAN durable water repellent is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Now, The Girl Who Ran for President, starring Virginia Bruce as Belva Lockwood on The Cavalcade of America. Uh, Mrs. Lockwood, we have your application for teacher in the district school. Now, as to your qualifications. I was graduated with honors from Genesee College, Master of Arts degree. Uh Uh-huh. You're married, of course. But my husband is an invalid, and I have a daughter. Oh, yes. Well, we merely wish to review the facts. We've decided to employ you beginning this fall. Thank you, sir. You're very kind. But, uh... Yes? Was there something else? Well, may I inquire what the salary will be? The usual for female teachers, eight dollars a week. Eight? But the men teachers get twenty. I know. Then they teach more pupils, have longer hours. No, not at all. Well, then perhaps their qualifications are greater than mine. No, matter of fact, Mrs. Lockwood, if we were judging from qualifications, you'd receive more than the men. Oh, in other words, I'll get less because I'm a woman. (laughs) Well, madam, it's a man's world, and that's the way of it. And from the time of that interview, Belva Lockwood set out to do something about the way of it. It wasn't easy. Her progress was limited, but her ambition increased with the passing years. Now it is several years later, in 1870. Belva's daughter has grown up. Her husband recovered. And in the office of a Washington, D.C. newspaper... Taisy! Taisy! Here here I am, sir, on my tiptoes and at your service. Come on into my office. I have an assignment for you. Union League Hall, 619 F Street, 3rd floor, 8 p.m. Ah, uh, what do I do there? As the most energetic reporter on this paper, that's for you to decide. <laughs> what is it, a church raffle? Uh, Mr. Tazy, if you don't like my assignments, perhaps you have some fine, fresh news of your own. Well, you know, sir, summer in Washington. Yes, I know. That's just when you need a good reporter. And uh, you admit being that, don't you? Certainly do. Well, then you must be able to uncover untold gems of news. Uh, Well, of course, there's that wooden sidewalk they're talking about putting along Pennsylvania Avenue. And the fire department bought six new devil grays. Keep right on. I can see millions rushing to buy the paper. George Pullman has a new sleeping car. Oh, and President Grant is rumored to need a haircut. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I give up. I go to 619 F Street, and what do I do? I'm only sending you, Tazy, because you have a humorous touch. If there's no news, the least we can provide is a light summer reading. All right, what is it? About two years ago, some silly woman comes to town and starts agitating. Doesn't like the way men run things. Thinks women can do it better. So she gets together six other silly women, and they form the uh, uh, Equal Rights Association of Washington. And that's a new story? Of course it isn't, but they hold meetings every Monday night, and I figured you could have a little fun with them. You know, play it for the ludicrous. <laughs> the 1870 revolt of the Amazons. I see. Here, here's ten dollars. Uh-huh. Union League Hall, 8 p.m. Take a few bums along with you. If uh, there was a little disturbance at the meeting. Uh-huh. What's the old girl's name? Belva Lockwood. Then I'm off. Headline, men insulted by Belva Lockwood. Riot for their rights. <laughs> Uh, 
Hey, you boss, when do we throw the cabbage? Just as soon as you fellas have got it all straight. But don't come in all at once and don't sit together. Hey, look, I don't have nothing to throw. They got cabbages and tomatoes. And Jerry and Duke got dish past the bank, but I ain't got nothing. Get some eggs. What's the signal to let go? Now, remember, we don't go in together. And you don't know me. And you... But well, you're a broad-minded gentleman ready to hear all sides of every question. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. But after all, there's a limit to a gentleman's endurance, ain't there, Jerry? Well, for a dollar, there's a limit to anything. Now, after I make a few remarks at the meeting, then I'll leave in a clerical huff of righteous indignation. That, then, is the signal for you to express your honest masculine opinion. You got it? Got it. Sure, come on, let's go. President to give a few words of explanation for the benefit of the several new and welcome faces I note here this evening. Mrs. Belva Lockwood, President of the Equal Rights Association of Washington, D.C. Thank you, thank you very much. Six weeks ago, we held our first meeting. Eight persons attended. Steadily, the attendance grew until we had 14. And now I am gratified to see that we have well over 20 and several new gentlemen. This gives us great encouragement for the future. Now, the purpose of our association is very simple and direct. We have dedicated ourselves to the securing of equal rights for all Americans, regardless of race, color, or sex. As a nation, we love to parade our democratic virtues before the world. Yet the majority of our citizens have absolutely no political rights. Women, for example, can't vote. This must be changed. Madam President. You have a question, sir. Is it your contention that woman is man's equal? Doesn't the Bible tell us that woman was created from the rib of man? How then can such a small part of the whole ever equal the whole? <laughs> we do not contend, Is sir. it your aim to destroy the chastity of the home and the sanctity of motherhood? Madam President, if I may correct the gentleman, I would like to say that I am Dr. Lockwood, the husband of Mrs. Belva Lockwood, and that she is a model wife and model mother to our two children. Then let us get back to a brat so I can hear him squalling. <laughs> it is our belief that a woman has not only her private duties, but her public and democratic duties and rights. The Constitution says all men are created equal. It says nothing about women. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, if you would allow me Forgive to explain... Forgive me if I... I can't stay to listen to this errant nonsense, debasing our men and demoralizing our women. Good night. Madam President, I move... Don't to... move, old lady. She's cracked. Let her stay still. <laughs> A change will be made. Politics, morals, religion. Good morning, Laura. Oh, good morning, Mother. Where's the morning paper, dear? Uh, it's over there. But uh, don't read it, Mother. Oh? There's something about last night's meeting? Yes, on the front page. It's nasty and mean. They're laughing at you. I know. But that's the way of the world. Well, doesn't it ever make you want to, to give up? No, not at all. I've been at it much too long. Belva, where are you, dear? In here. And I have a husband who considers his wife something more than a housekeeper. I'm going to the office now. All right, dear. Uh, I guess you saw the newspaper. No, not yet. Well, when you read it, just remember that a jeer on page one is better than two polite lines hidden on page five. Darling, can you sit down a minute? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. What's the matter? Well, I'd like to say something. Sit down, Laura. All right, Mother. What are you plotting now? After the meeting last night, I lay awake a long time. I couldn't sleep because I was thinking about something. Oh, uh, it didn't worry you, did it? No, because the most wonderful thing about this country is that when there's an injustice done, it can be legally changed. No tyrant makes our laws, we do. And we can change our laws through Congress. Mm, that takes time, you know, and a knowledge of law. I know it. 
So if laws can be changed, the person who wants them changed should know how to do it. Mother, what are you thinking about? The law. Belva, is it what I think it is? Yes, it is. Well, what? what? What's this all about? I think, Laura, your mother's made up her mind to study law. Is that right, Belva? That's it. I'm going to be a lawyer. That is, if my family approves and will help. <laughs> well, you go right ahead. Of course, Mother. Thank you, darlings. I was sure you'd say that. Uh, Mrs. Lockwood, this is the third time I've brought your petition before our faculty, and the third time they've flatly refused to allow you to enter the law school. But why, Mr. Wedgwood? Surely you as vice-chancellor. I did all I could. They simply won't have a woman. They feel that your presence in classes would uh, distract the young men. Oh, Mr. Wedgwood, I'm 40 years old. And if these young men are so easily distracted, I should think they'd better start getting used to it. I wish there was something I could do. Oh, Mr. Wedgwood, if I could find a group of 15 women who wanted to study law, would you work with us privately? Why, I think I would. I must say it's hard to refuse you anything. But you realize that such a course would not entitle you to a diploma. And without a degree, you could not practice law. Let me get the knowledge first. Then I'll find a way to use it. Case of the United States versus, versus the Kent Commentary, chapters 11 and 13. People versus Dr. Wingroom. C. Pomeroy and Constitutional Law. Page 261, Blackstone, Chapter 5, Book 1. The very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during marriage. Oh, that's what you think, dear Mr. Blackstone. Dred Scott decisions. Dred Scott. Dreadful Belva dreads dreadful Scott. Law of incorporeal hereditaments. Oh, hereditament. Law against incorporeal women, month after month, beating their incorporeal brains out, studying incorporeal hereditament. Well, Mrs. Lockwood, feeling a bit haggard after the examination? Oh, I feel as if I were the last gasp of the incorporeal hereditary. Oh, dear. But how are my papers? Of the 15 women who started this class, only you and Miss Hall had the persistency to slave through to the end. My examination. Did I pass? Please, oh, you did brilliantly. Oh, thank heaven. Then I'll get my diploma. I can practice law. Uh, sit down, Mrs. Lockwood, uh, please. Thank you, I... What's the matter? Mr. Wedge, with that funny look in your eyes. What's wrong? I've just come from pleading your case before the faculty. As I warned you, there will be no diploma. Oh, no. But I did the same work as the men students. Even better than most of them. Look, Mr. Wedgwood, I studied months and months. I, I feel as though I don't wear dresses anymore, but that I'm, I'm bound between the covers of Blackstone. Why can't I have that diploma? <sighs> I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. The way it is, I'm tired of hearing that same old thing. I studied, I, I passed brilliantly, you said. Now, you must help me, because I, I've got to practice law. Oh, Mrs. Lockwood, if there was something I could do, but I only make out the diplomas. I, I don't sign them. Well, who does? President Grant. Since this is the National University Law School... You must make him sign mine. I? Make the president sign? There must be some way. Oh, my dear Mrs. Lockwood, Don't I... you want me to have that diploma? Of course I do. Can't we think of something? Well, I can't... Well, it's impossible, but I... Yes? I... What were you going to say? Oh, dear, dear. This will be irregular, but... If I absent-mindedly made out your diploma, and if through some error it was mixed up with the others... A clerical error? Exactly. Huh? Now, if the diploma should accidentally get to President Grant, then with all the rush of state affairs, suppose he should scribble off a dozen signatures on the diplomas without looking. Oh, Mr. Wedgwood, that would be wonderful. <laughs> listening to The Girl Who Ran for President, starring Virginia Bruce as Belva Lockwood on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry.
Belva Lockwood, determined to bring equal rights for women, studies law in order to be more efficient. However, she's informed she cannot have a diploma to practice law because she is a woman. But the diplomas, hers included, get to President Grant's desk. And there... Uh, Mr. President, there's one more thing. What? Oh, no, no, no more for today. I want time for a haircut. Uh, the diplomas for the National Law School, sir, they require your signature. Oh, please, please. They're, they'll be here tomorrow. It's, uh, it's late. But the messenger's waiting, sir. Oh, all right. Give me my pen. Yes, sir, and the diplomas are all laid out for you. <laughs> do you... Do you know the difference between a diploma and a constitutional amendment? Well, sir, I tell you... <laughs> well, you can sign a diploma without reading it. <laughs> all right, all right. This is to certify, certify, certify. Albert Baker, Belva Lockwood, uh, Howard Mann... <laughs> Get over to Academy Hall. Two thousand women there to hear Belva Lockwood. What's Belva up to now? She's a lawyer now. Drew up a civil service bill. Well, 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 how the world wags. Maybe someday they'll finish the Washington Monument. Women who work in the civil service are allowed a maximum of $75 a month. For exactly the same work, men get three times as much. This is the law. But this is the United States. And in the United States, an unjust law can be changed. This law is unjust. This must be changed. <laughs> the Honorable S.M. Arnell of Tennessee will introduce the civil service bill we have drawn up. Urge your congressman to support it. Hey, look at this. Hereafter, all clerks and employees in civil service of the United States shall be paid with reference to character and services performed by them, irrespective of sex. Well, well, how the world changes. Mother, there's a reporter asking to see you. Oh, do show him in. I love reporters. Will you come in, sir? Oh, thank you. Oh, this is very good of you, Mrs. Lockwood. My name's Tazy. Oh, yes. What can I do for you, Mr. Tazy? I'd like to ask a few questions about the future of America's woman lawyers. Go right ahead. But don't distort this interview. I know about libel laws now. Ma'am? Nowadays, Mr. Tazy, I'm somewhat more effective than I was two years ago when you so graciously broke up our meeting. Oh, well, believe me, I've been mighty sorry for that. <laughs> I'll believe you when I read it in the paper. Now, questions, sir? Well, this fight of yours for equal rights, isn't that reaching for the moon? I don't believe in the moon. Each day I reach for a candle, and I get my friends to reach for a candle. They get their friends. Each day another candle, and in that way before too long, we'll have a light that will darken the moon. I see. The Civil Service Bill was one candle. The candle I'm reaching for now is the Supreme Court. I put my application in only yesterday. At present, they won't allow women lawyers to practice before that august body. But that will be changed. Mother, look at these headlines. Women get into Supreme Court in spite of judges. Suffragists win first round. First woman admitted to bar in U.S. Supreme Court. How oh, isn't it wonderful your bill went through? Hmm. And what does our Mr. Tazy have to say? Oh, let's see. Oh, here. Mrs. Lockwood stood very straight as she took the solemn oath. Although her hands trembled as she accepted the classic sheepskin, we know that before long the court will resound with her pleas for justice, glowing as did the Italian Portia at the bar of Venice. <laughs> well, well, how the world does change. No dishpans or cabbages this time. <laughs> Mr. Daisy must have liked my new hat. But you're a woman, Mother. Yes, I know. I've never forgotten it. Oh, I've got to sit down. Surprised, Lura? No, I guess not. Not anymore. But is it really true you're actually nominated for president? Yes, dear. I was. Of the United States. Is there any better presidency to run for? And you're going to run against James G. Blaine and Grover Cleveland? I believe they're the other candidates. 
Oh, Mother, you're wonderful. Melba, if you're going to the rally, you'd better leave now. Yes, dear. Oh, uh, by the way, there's a large uh, uh, contraption at the front door delivered to you. Contra... Oh, my tricycle. Your what? Come on, let's look at it. Father, what does she mean? She means she bought a tricycle. Well, what for? Well, if I know your mother, she intends to ride it. On the street? Yes, it would be inconvenient in the house. <clears throat> well, Melva, think you can manage it? Oh, it's beautiful. And it's black. Just what I ordered to go with my new dress. I'll ride it to the rally. But, Mother, you've never tried it. Now you'll get hurt. Oh, nonsense. One gets on like this. Mother? Uh, be careful, dear. No, oh, it's very simple. And look, it's got a bell. <laughs> what a grandmother you are. Wait till I tell the children. Oh, you tell my grandchildren. If they're good, I'll give them a ride on the handlebars. <laughs> now take care of yourselves. I'm off for the rally. <laughs> <laughs> the nation, the Equal Rights Party has decided to enter its own candidate, and as its candidate for the presidency of the United States, the Equal Rights Party has selected Mrs. Belva Lockwood. Latest returns from Illinois, Belva Lockwood, 1,008 votes. California, Belva Lockwood, 734. New York cast 1,346 votes for Mrs. Lockwood. Mrs. Lockwood carries entire electoral vote of Indiana. Latest, New York swings the election to Grover Cleveland. Well, Belva, it's all over. Blaine has conceded the election. Yes, dear, I know. And so has Belva Lockwood. Seriously, Mrs. Lockwood, what did you think your chances were? Mr. Tazy, I ran for office in an attempt to attract the attention of the people to an awareness of injustice. Because I believe that the strength of democracy lies in an enlightened electorate. The chances of my becoming president were nil. I knew that. But because of what has happened to me, the chances of the citizens of this country someday winning all their just rights are tremendous. This may not happen in my lifetime. Yet happen, it will. Our government may make errors, but thank God it rests on the great corrective base of a sturdy, freedom-loving people. Men and women. I see. You're really very wonderful, Mrs. Lockwood. And you'll go down in history as the girl who ran for president. Perhaps. But right now, I've got to go down Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Can I give you a lift? I have a carriage outside. Oh, no, no, thank you. My tricycle is still good enough. But aren't you afraid of the horse cars? Oh, they'll have to catch me first. Goodbye, Mr. Tazy. There's lots of work to be done. Goodbye. <laughs> Elva Lockwood lived to be 86. In the last year of her life, she was still campaigning. She helped to re-elect Woodrow Wilson. He was the president under whose administration woman suffrage was legalized. It was another dream of another American come true. Jane Whitman speaking for DuPont. This is the time of year when many Americans, in the cities and on the farms, find themselves dreaming of hunting days ahead. Perhaps it's a dream of the whistle of wings on a windy day in a grand, lonely duck marsh, or a logging road along a wooded ridge ablaze with maples and white with birch, when every sense is alert 
with the sudden whir of a flying partridge. Or their dream may be of a silent stand on a big game trail in the vast rimrock country of the West. For these are days when hunting dogs get special care. Ducks and geese trace familiar patterns in the sky. Pheasants glide over the grain fields. Rabbits bounce through thickets. And deer flash through tall timber. Hunting days, when more than 10 million Americans will go out on the land to enjoy the sport of shooting. Love of hunting and of sporting firearms is an American heritage handed down to us by pioneers to whom a gun was friend and protector as well as provider. The Remington Arms Company, an associate of the DuPont Company, began making sporting firearms in 1816. Today, Remington, including its Peters Cartridge Division, is one of the foremost manufacturers of sporting firearms and ammunition. The making of sporting rifles and shotguns and accurate, powerful ammunition calls for products having the precision of a watch, coupled with the strength and power of a locomotive. Remington's manufacturing experience, extending over 130 years, supplemented by the latest developments in scientific and engineering methods, provides fine, dependable sporting arms and ammunition for every purpose from the hunting of Kansas jackrabbits to Alaskan brown bear. Who wouldn't like to be a crack shot? The name has just as big a thrill for boys today, yes, and girls too, as it had in the days of the pioneers in the great woods. If you would like a copy of the Remington Arms Company's booklet, How to Be a Crack Shot, jam-packed with tips on plain and fancy rifle shooting, just send your name and address to the radio section, DuPont Company, Wilmington, 98, Delaware. Lou Gehrig called him Jidge. The man who taught him baseball called him George. But to millions of fans, he is known as Babe Ruth. Next Monday night, the week when the umpire shout of play ball issues in another great World Series... The DuPont Cavalcade of America will present Brian Donlevy in Big Boy, the heartwarming story of Babe Ruth, baseball's immortal bambino, the sultan of SWAT, the babe who has never forgotten his best friends, the kids. Carrying 100 of America's priceless historical documents, the Freedom Train's 30,000-mile journey through every state has begun. Leaving Philadelphia, the Freedom Train passed the weekend in Atlantic City and Trenton, New Jersey. Tonight, it is on exhibit in Elizabeth, New Jersey. We'll move on to Patterson tomorrow, and on Thursday, Bill of Rights Day, we'll pull into New York for five days before going on to New England and other Middle Atlantic states. The documents aboard the Freedom Train should be seen by all Americans and should develop an appreciation for the liberties we all enjoy as a free people. So, all aboard, Americans, for your Freedom Train. The music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our play tonight was based on the book The Girl Who Ran for President by Laura Kerr, just published last week by Thomas Nelson and Sons and was adapted for radio by Halstead Wells and Ruth Adams Knight. Virginia Bruce may soon be seen in the Paramount picture Night Has a Thousand Eyes. This is Frank Bingman inviting you to listen next week to Big Boy, starring Brian Donlevy on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.